Treasury stick just changed around here, buddy. You're looking at it. You are now listening to the Outsiders Podcast, the most exciting and hard-hitting show on the net. And now, bringing it hard as always, here are your hosts, Clint Schweitzer and Noah Groniger. And welcome back to the Outsiders Podcast. Clint Schweitzer alongside Noah Groniger. And we're talking about the number 14 Gonzaga Bulldogs right now. Gonzaga Hoops. And what better time, Noah? Gonzaga seems to really be hitting their stride. They're playing a lot of tough uh, competition here in the non-con. Coming off the one loss a couple of weeks ago to Illinois. But a big win over Kansas State this past weekend. Let's not forget that. Uh, I mean, I, where do you see the Bulldogs right now as conference season is about to, about to begin? Uh, it's kind of troubling with the loss to Illinois. Uh, Kevin Pangos, uh, our sophomore guard, is having trouble this sophomore season. He had a great freshman campaign, and he just can't seem to find a shot. He can't seem to create uh, his own lanes, his own uh, shot off the dribble. So we're going to have to get that figured out. Gary Bell is having a great season. Uh, David Stockton, I think he should maybe be our point guard. And I'm just not sure what we do with Pangos. Maybe shooting guard, move Bell to small forward. That's kind of a small lineup, though. Uh, Elias Harris, uh, one of the best players in the nation, is leading us in points and rebounds. 15.5 points per game, uh, I believe seven and a half rebounds per game. Kelly Olenek has been a stud. He uh, was suspended at the beginning of the year for conduct detrimental to the team, but he's back and he's playing better than ever. He redshirted last year, which was really unexpected, uh, but he really need to work on his game, become more mature, and uh, get some muscle on his uh, frame, and he's done that. Um, we've had trouble guarding the three-point lane or the three-point line, and uh, we're working on our defense. Mark Few's made uh, an emphasis about defense this year. Gonzaga's usually uh, more concerned about the offense, but this year he really wants to focus on the defense. Didn't help us in the Illinois game, but hopefully it will uh, with uh, Baylor and Oklahoma State coming up. Well, Gonzaga fans, we got a big treat for you because Matt Santangelo, color man, uh, ex guard for the Gonzaga Bulldogs during the Elite Eight run. This is a guy career with a lot of accolades. Career assist leader, fourth in uh, points um, all time for Gonzaga. So he's getting right ready to join Adam us. Morrison. Hey, we're going to be talking Gonzaga basketball with Matt Santangelo coming up here. And uh, Noah, you briefly alluded to the one loss uh, Gonzaga has, which was to the Illinois Fighting Illini. Uh, a loss that I didn't see coming personally. I thought Illinois had kind of uh, got through a cupcake schedule and got through Hawaii playing uh, some kind of loser competition. They did have the win over Butler, but Illinois comes into that game, and boy, were they on fire with Brandon Paul. That was the downfall for Gonzaga in that game. And you talk about guarding the perimeter. It's going to be important from here out. Yeah, well, they beat Butler, and Butler beat uh, number one Indiana, so True. that's looking like a great win. They're number 19. Uh, Butler is in the nation. Uh, Illinois is 10 right now. Uh, they've got a big game uh, coming up against Missouri uh, Saturday, bragging rights in St. Louis. And uh, Illinois, they just we were up, I believe, 11 to 13 points. Gonzaga was, but Illinois with their three-point shooting and Brandon Paul just dominating, taking over. We seem to have a problem with uh, having stud players. Uh, if they just have one on a team, they can take over a game against Gonzaga. They're more a more balanced team. They don't have the one big star uh, like some other teams do. And when we face another team like Illinois who has one and Brandon Paul, we seem to struggle. Well, I want to ask you about this. I want because the identity of the Gonzaga Bulldogs. This has been a team. When you think about Gonzaga, you think about great guard play. You think about you know Derek Rivio and all these great Dan players. Dickow, Dan Dickow, Blake Stepp. I mean, thank you. Yeah, you keep going. And Matt he, Bolden was one. And and, and this what, Richie Fromm. What can't is forget him. what is the identity of this team? Because this team has some size, has some physical. This has two seven footers on the roster. What, what's the identity of this team? What do they want to be? You know, uh, offensively and, and and I mean, do you feel like they're a tough? Uh, rebounding team and, and physical enough to to win the uh, league again. I don't know if they're physical enough. I don't. I mean, Illinois is a smaller team, and they uh, got the offensive boards against them. They're more scrappy. Um, Kelly Olynyk, Elias Harris, uh, Shemek Karnowski. Those are our three big guys. Um, I really like Olynyk and Karnowski uh, as far as getting boards go. Um, Karnowski's still trying to work out his offensive game. He's just kind of a big oaf out there getting boards. Uh, Olenek has really worked on his game. I like his offensive style. Um, Elias Harris, he's kind of a European-style player. Uh, he's from Germany, so that makes sense. And um, he's not really 
you can't really call him a big forward. You, I, you're not sure if he's a small forward. He can handle the ball. He can bring it up for you. He's not uh, bad with the basketball. He's got some handles. Uh, he can bring it up on the floor. He can post up. He can do a little bit of everything. He's not great at one thing, um, but he's just having a great year. He's a great player. I think he's definitely going to go to the NBA. He's uh, talented. They'll find a way to use him and uh, work him in, whether it's him being able to handle the ball up the floor, uh, kind of like a poor man's LeBron James. He can kind of do a little bit of everything. Uh, unfortunately for him, he can't do it as well as LeBron can, obviously. Well, <laughs> not many can, if anyone. Well, and I think they wanted to go up tempo too. Uh, they have those smaller guards. They want to kind of work inside out. They want to go uh, get Elias Harris, Kelly Olynyk touches down in the middle, and then kick it out to uh, Pangos or Bell. Well, you know, I, I want to bring up this again about Gonzaga, a team that always plays a tough non-conference, and they've come out. They played Illinois. Uh, they've beaten Kansas State. They've got some more Big Twelve teams coming up: Baylor and Oklahoma State. Uh, it just, they just seem to seem to be a team that will go out and play these guys, and I think it, it, it helps them. You know, you, you hear a lot of talk about, you know, not playing a cupcake schedule because if you play a cupcake schedule, it doesn't help you come tournament time. I think this is going to definitely help Gonzaga playing these tournament-type teams. And, uh, and Baylor coming up here, Jackson, one of the best point guards in America, that's going to be a, a really interesting test for them. This is a Baylor team that went into Kentucky and won in Lexington. But other than that, they've been very shaky, as many Scott Drew team Coach uh, Scott Drew, coach teams are so I, again. I like Gonzaga going forward. I think they're going to win out, uh, you know, before conference season. And just tell me, give me a little bit of uh, of insight as to on the, the West Coast Conference and, and what other teams are expected to be good and who Gonzaga is going to have to go through to to win yet another title. BYU and most importantly Santa Clara, our rival. Steve Nash went to Santa Clara. Right now they have a great guard, Matthew Delabadova. Um, he's. I thought he was gone after this year, or after last year. I was hoping, but uh, apparently those guys he's back always, again. they always stick around yes. longer than you want them to be. He's back again. Uh, he's going to torture us. It's going to be a tough test against Santa Clara. Uh, I believe we split the series last year. Uh, hopefully, we can get them this year. BYU is always tough. Uh, they're a great program, and uh, we're going to definitely have to hit the boards against them to try and work our way through BYU. Santa Clara. I don't know what we're going to do with Della Badova. He's a tough matchup. He seems to uh, be kind of like the old Zag guards, uh, take uh, four, five, six steps behind the three-point line and chuck it up, and it always goes in. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to ask Matt Santangelo about this team and about uh, his teams here at Gonzaga, and we're gonna, very pleased to be able to bring Matt on, and we will see what he has to say about all things Gonzaga basketball. And we are joined currently by former Gonzaga Bulldogs guard, current color man for the Gonzaga Bulldogs, uh, Matt Santangelo. Matt, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're talking Gonzaga hoops, and uh, just welcome to the show. Uh, wanted to get started here talking about uh, your career because uh, you had a unique situation in that you guys went to the Elite Eight under Dan Monson and then transitioned into Mark Few. I just kind of wanted to first get your take before we get in on the current Zags, your take on, on that transition and, and, and the difference between those two coaches. Well, no, that, that's a great question. First of all, thank you for uh, for having me on, and happy holidays to everyone listening. Um, I actually had three different coaches during my time at GU. I, I came, uh, I started my career at GU under Coach Fitzgerald, which was kind of the old dog, um, the original Zag. So I had for a, a program and a school that has had such great stability. Um, I actually had three different coaches in, in four years, which is quite interesting. So I. Um, but the transition was actually pretty smooth between all three of me, from Fitzgerald to Coach Munson and Coach Munson to Coach Few. Um, I, uh, you know, even under Coach Fitzgerald, all the assistant coaches, which Munson and Few were when I was there, uh, you know, they had a lot of input. They had a lot of impact on practices, on strategy, on, on different things. So really, when the, when the transition happened and, you know, everyone kind of moved one seat down the bench, uh, it was pretty smooth because we knew what to expect because they were so hands-on as assistant coaches. All right, before we get into the current state of the Zags, I'd like to go back and ask you about your memories of Richie Fromm, Casey Calvary, Axel Dench, uh, Mark Spank, uh, Quinton Hall, so many more, and uh, your amazing run to the Elite Eight kicking off this whole Zag craze. Well, it was, I mean, uh, well, I don't know what to tell you about that. It was, it was pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing to be a part of. It's, it's actually kind of surreal and pretty amazing that we still talk about it 13 years later. You know, it still impacts my, you know, almost my daily life um, as I live in Spokane here and obviously close to the program through uh, the radio color commentary. So it's pretty spectacular. Actually, we had five seniors that year, myself, Richie Fromm, 
Mike Nielsen, Ryan Floyd, and Axel Bench, the big Australian. And four of those five uh, still live here in Spokane. So myself and Ryan Floyd and Mike Nielsen all have kids the same age. We're really involved in the community in Spokane, so we see each other a lot. Um, and then through the, the wonderful creation of Facebook, we actually get to keep in touch with Axel Bench um, as well, who has a young family. So it's it's really still a close knit group. Casey Calvary's here. You know, I live a couple doors down from Mark Spink's brother, another former Zeg, Scott Spink, who was a couple years older than we were. Um, and there's just a ton of players. So we really feel like it's it's definitely family first uh, inside the Zeg family. Uh, we actually have a two-part question uh, from our Facebook page. One of our fans, John Springer, uh, asks if Gonzaga can make it to an Elite Eight again like you guys did back in 98. And also, do you think uh, Gonzaga would have the same success if they left the WCC? Oh, that's really a great question. Um, you know, I do think they can get to Elite Eight. Uh, I don't think, you know, there's only a couple handful of teams that when they set out at the beginning of the year that they say, you know, we're going to make it to a Final Four and they make it to a Final Four. I mean, everyone's kind of gunning for it. And I, I think our group is a testament to how much, you know, skill, hard work, but also a lot of luck uh, goes into that NCAA tournament for uh, that type of success. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's what's why it's the greatest sporting event, in my opinion, that we have uh, in is March Madness because it's so unpredictable. Um, I definitely think uh, the teams they have. I mean, they've had a handful of teams that probably uh, you know should have gone that far, uh, and because of the magic of the NCAA tournament, uh, matchups and different games and bad nights and whatever the situation may be, weren't able to get there. Um, this particular group, which I know we'll get into, is pretty special. Uh, and so I don't think it's, you know, I don't, I'm not predicting they're going to the Final Four, but they're certainly capable of it. Um, I think that's two different things. So I think this group is pretty talented, pretty deep. And so it's, uh, um, you know, I, I think I think the possibility is there for sure. And as far as them leaving uh, the West Coast Conference and going on and having success, I mean, you know, from a, from a fan standpoint, uh, I, yeah, I can't, how awesome would it be for the Catholic Seven or whatever the Big East uh, founders coming out and then making a national, um, you know, basketball brand and gosh, for even Gonzaga to be a part of that conversation is pretty spectacular. You know, logistically, I don't know how that works. You know, traveling back and forth to all over the country uh, to play league games. I mean, just travel up and down the West Coast is hard enough. And now you're going to add, you know, Georgetown to the mix and as far east as you can go. And they have to come here with the time zone changes. Logistically, I don't know how it works. But from a fan's perspective, I think it would just be spectacular. All right, being a former Gonzaga guard, have you been able to identify Kevin Pangos' struggles so far in his sophomore season, I mean, compared to his outstanding freshman campaign? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question, too. Kevin's a wonderful player. Um, he really is, and he's, he, he came in as a wonderful shooter. I think there's a couple things going on. You know, first of all, Coach he was a little bit uh, reluctant to call what he's, what he's experienced in a slump uh, because he sees him every day in practice. I mean, Kevin Pangos is knocking down shots every day in practice. Um and so, uh, you know, I think for the game it's going to come. I think one of the things that Kevin has done over the summer is that he's added some things to his game. He didn't want to be just a three-point shooter. He wanted to be someone who could put the ball on the floor, get into the lane, you know, either score or create for teammates. And so he spent a lot of time working on that this summer. So I think right now, he, you know, whereas last year maybe that limitation made him better in the fact that he was, uh, you know, a wonderful three-point shooter. Or now his versatility is hurting him a little bit, where he doesn't know if he's going to stop and shoot if he wants to put it on the floor and drive to the basket. You know, and that hesitation throws off timing, it throws off rhythm. You know, and now that he has enough body work, enough games where he's kind of been, you know, less than we expect. Um, you know, that now it's, it's looking like, you know, what's going on. So, you know, Kevin is a really a, a mentally tough player and young man. I don't, I, I don't see it as a problem. I think it's going to come. You know, also with this particular edition of the GU team, um, they're so strong on the inside that they don't shoot a lot of threes by Tom Vegas standards. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't get a lot of attempts on goal. So I think it's just a matter of time. I mean, he works so hard that I just, I have to believe that it's going to, uh, you know, he'll, he'll get a rhythm here. He'll, he'll get back to the percentages that we expect from him. Well, Gonzaga's had trouble guarding the three-point shot, shot this year, uh, which we brutally witnessed against Illinois, especially their outstanding guard, Brandon Paul. Uh, how can we fix this glaring weakness defensively? Well, it's, it's always been a challenge. And I don't know, um, you know, I don't, uh, obviously I'm real close to Gonzaga, and I follow college basketball pretty well, but I don't know what team guards the three-point shot, you know, shuts it down. Because Illinois, what happened, in, in my opinion, is that they were so focused on guarding the three 
see early on that they gave Illinois layups, right? So you got to pick your poison a little bit. Teams are good, players are good. So you got to look to take away something. So they were so cognizant, so focused on taking away the three that they gave Illinois layups. They had to make adjustments. Now the defense is completely at the mercy of the offense because you're guessing. You don't want to give a layup, but you don't want to give up threes. Well, you can't stop both, especially when you have a guy like Illinois who has a player like Brandon Paul who was head and shoulders better than everyone else on the floor that night and is a spectacular, you know, spectacular player. So, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, then you got a, a game like Campbell, um, the good old fighting Camels from Campbell U, uh, who came in and they shot, you know, to break them, they don't shoot the ball very well from three. I think they were shooting in the 20s as a team, and they shoot 50%. So that, to me, is a bigger, that one's a, a more of a, not a red flag, but a more of a question mark um, than the Illinois team, because Illinois is good. So, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what the necessary the answer is to that. We do a, this particular team does a lot of pressing. Um, you know, they do a lot of different things on pick and rolls. They, the coaches ask a lot of these players as far as to make reads, make them quick, and make them effective um, defensively as well. I think sometimes it's um, maybe overstimulation. Too many things, you get back your mind and you miss a rotation. You don't fly around. You're so conscious of, of thinking the game through that sometimes you just don't fly around. You know, you're, you're like, you don't want to make a mistake. you got to make this rotation. And you kind of forget to say, well, if I just play hard, everything's going to be okay um, and fly around. So, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a, it's a huge thing. I, I think in college basketball, especially when you get up to, you know, Gonzaga's level, Illinois' level, I mean, that top 15, top 20, top 25, guys are good, you know. They, they're going to they're gonna do different things. They're going to knock down threes. They're going to be able to put the ball on the floor. Um, and, and ultimately, you have to be able to pick your poison and, and stick to a strategy. Now, one thing that uh, Gonzaga's always gotten credit for, and it's no different this year, is playing a tough non-conference schedule. I mean, go into you know how beneficial that is for uh, for past teams and how it's going to be for this team. I mean, you talked about uh, the tough loss to Illinois, but also took on Kansas State in a neutral site, uh, played in the Old Spice Classic, going to be taking on Baylor and Oklahoma State. Just a, always a laundry list of very good programs that uh, Gonzaga seems to take on, and uh, just how beneficial is that for them? Well, I think it's incredible. I mean, look, if you look at a, a, a almost Gonzaga's hallmark, at least the way it was when we played there, is anyone, anywhere. I mean, we, we had to travel in order to play these big teams. We had to, for, for our group, we had to go into Michigan State. We had to, we had to go, you know, and play these games in this type of schedule. It's always kind of been a hallmark for, for you to schedule that way. Now, as of the last couple of years, especially with the addition of BYU to conference, I mean, conference plays better. Last year, the West Coast Conference was a three-team league into the NCAA tournament, um, which is really something unique. But Gonzaga continues to schedule it. So you get exposed, and what that exposure does and what Gonzaga's shown, especially, for example, going from Illinois to Kansas State, is that they can get better. So they, they, they match up with a team like Illinois. They get some weaknesses exposed. They have a bad night. They take a loss. But then they learn from it, and they go into Kansas State and really do a number on Kansas State, um, which is, could have been as dangerous a team as Illinois. You know, maybe not the same level, but, you know, in the conversation. And so I think those are the things that you see and you expect from this GU team is that you're going to play big-time college basketball early and often in the season, and you're going to have to learn, adjust, and you're going to have to be you know on your P's and Q's from the get-go. I mean, you got you mentioned it, Baylor on the 28th, Oklahoma State on the 31st in Stillwater. Then conference starts, and you still have a matchup with Butler on ESPN game day on January 19th in Hankel Fieldhouse in Indiana. So, I mean, it, from a fan's perspective, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, being able to do the radio is gosh, off the charts for me to be able to go and, and watch these games and, and be a part of it all. Um, but it, it's kind of a hallmark at GU. It's what we expect. And it's one of the reasons why they have so much brand, you know, so much brand recognition, so much national appeal is because they will play, um, you know, anyone, anywhere. And that's commendable. All right. Tough question here. Uh, do you think Mark View and the Gonzaga program has what it takes to win a national championship, or are they just a really good mid-major who will never be quite good enough to, pardon the pun, duke it out with the big boys as far as winning a national championship is concerned? Well, I think the whole Duke comment was a low blow. That's the first thing I'm going to say to that question. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know what it, what it takes to, to win a national championship. Like I said, that tournament is, is uh, a really unique a unique animal and, and all that we had from success. I mean, really, what did we do? We only won three games to get to the Elite Eight in March. I mean, that's, that's essentially what we did. Um, and so, you 
know, I, I would like to believe we do. I mean, we, I just talked about Butler. Um, obviously, he's the other mid-major that, uh, that we talk about and compare um, to GU. I mean, what would you rather have is one of the questions that, that I asked. Is would you rather have you know a Final Four national championship trying to miss the tournament, or would you rather have a, a, a situation like Don Vega that is consistent every year and in the tournament and in the conversation every year? So I, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm posing that question back to, to all of you and the listeners. Um, but I would I would hope that with every addition, you know, coaches learn a little bit, obviously players learn a little bit, um, but it also takes a lot of luck too. So I guess that the, I didn't really answer the question. I would like to think so, that they do will have the ability to get to the Final Four and compete for a national championship, um, but it certainly remains to be seen because they haven't been able to do it yet. Going back to your career, I mean, does the name Khalid El Amin stick in your brain and uh, <laughs> <laughs> how you guys uh, barely lost that game uh, almost heading to the Final Four? Uh, well, that one, you know, it's a fantastic game. You know, with, with our particular group, I mean, the one thing I, I, I try to tell people, because, you know, I get that question posed to me every once in a while, um, is that it's it's a little bit, you know, with our particular group, we went as hard as we could. I mean, we left it all on the floor. We, there's no looking back. Um, you know, to be able to compete with a, a wonderful Connecticut team, um, even more so than Quiddo, I mean, a guy by the name of Rip Hamilton maybe, maybe sticks in my head a little more. And for me personally, a guy by the name of Ricky Moore, who was the one I matched up with and and really did a number on me defensively. Um, you know, these are guys that I, I, I guess, battled with more in those games, but we still, we played the national championship to the last minute, or the national champ, eventual national champion to the last minute. You know, we gave him our closest game in the tournament. Uh, and all that is, uh, you know, it's still pretty special. And so I think for us, um, uh, it's not so much, I mean, we just leave it all on the floor. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to have been there and to have, have been able to compete at that level. And I think that's kind of how, you know, at least I look at it. And I'm sure our teammates, you know, may think one way or the other, um, may have a different opinion. But they all left it on the floor, too. I mean, we gave it everything we had. Well, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Matt. I mean, career assist leader, uh, 668 uh, career points, your fourth with uh, 1,810. I mean, it, I grew up being a fan. I mean, I've been a fan for 15 years. You were on the team when I first started being a fan. It's absolutely amazing having you on, and we cannot thank you enough. Well, no, I really appreciate you guys having me on. And like I said, happy holidays to everyone. And if you ever need another Dunbeg insight, just let me know. Hey, we really appreciate it. We'll definitely catch up with you as the West Coast Conference uh, skit slate gets underway. You guys have a wonderful holiday season as well, and we'll uh, catch up with you soon, Matt. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. And that's Matt Santangelo joining us, uh, one of the best guards in Gonzaga history, the current color man on the radio for the Gonzaga Bulldogs Radio Network, and uh, really appreciate his efforts today. Wow, I've got goosebumps right now. Hey, I mean, he brought it. Went, my first time uh, becoming a Zags fan in the 98 season, uh, the 97 98 season, but yeah. 98 when uh, they were in the tournament and going for uh, the Elite Eight like they did, losing to. Uh, Connecticut uh, for a trip to the Final Four and Khalid El Amin. I'll never forget that name because he torched as he was a killer. And uh, just loved hearing his stories about him and their run to the Elite Eight. And I can remember Matt uh, and Richie and Casey Calvary and Axel Dench and Quentin Hall and all those great uh, players for Gonzaga back in the late 90s and their magnificent magical run. And I loved hearing what he had to say about the current Zags, how Kevin Pangos is struggling a little bit and how he needs to work uh, on his game a little bit to create his own shot. And just, wow, I can't believe we had him on. Career assist leader, fourth in points. Great hearing from Matt. Hey, this was, uh, I tell you what, you, you, the, the nation started to hear Gonzaga's name in that 97-98 season. That's the first time anyone had ever heard of him. They, they came on the scene a lot, you know, a George Mason, a team that comes out of nowhere and a school that a lot, most people hadn't heard of. Since then, I'll tell you what, Mark Few has put together one of the best programs in the nation. I'll tell you what, it's time for them to get back to an Elite Eight, to a Final Four. Uh, they have had uh, tournament struggles uh, yeah. since that Elite Eight run, even though they have been a, current, consistently a top program. And why do you think that is? I mean, I just don't like their defense. I think they're, they have got great guard play, but I don't think they, they're tough enough inside. Um, they rely on jump shots a lot, and uh, that's just not good enough when you get up against the big boys. Uh, in the Elite Eight, it was just a magical run. Uh, I mean, they beat Stanford. They beat, I believe it was number two seed Florida back then. 
and they were just hitting the miracle threes, and Santangelo and Fromm were great at it, and they were clutch, and uh, since then, we've had Dan Dickow. He lost to, like, Wyoming and Nevada uh, with, I believe it was Kirk Snyder, if I'm getting that name right, with Nevada. And uh, we had, obviously, the Blake Step, I believe, double overtime loss. He tried to lay it off the glass, and it hit off the rim and went out against uh, Arizona Blake Step. It was devastating. Um, I didn't talk to my friends. I was watching over at a friend's house. I didn't talk to him for, oh, God, I don't know how long it was at least like three hours while they were in the basement playing Mario Kart or something. I didn't go down. I just sat in the in a chair, just blank stare at the ceiling. And uh, then the Adam Morrison UCLA famous game. Uh, Batista with the catch! And, and Farmar, Jordan Farmar, crushed my hopes and dreams. And Adam Morrison's uh, crying because his career is over. Him and J.J. Redick uh, split the National Player of the Year. Uh, Adam Morrison, we won't talk about his NBA career. Not sure he wants to hear about or that. Or J.J. Reddick's, for that matter. J.J.'s, at least he's still on his team and playing. Uh, he's still hitting some threes for the Magic down there. Um, I was recording that game, and we were up big halftime, and I went on, uh, I believe it was like Yahoo or AOL chat, AIM, AIM, um, AOL Instant Messenger, to uh, Sam Robinson, one of my good friends, uh, talking about the game, and I was like, oh, we're going to blow it in the second half. And what do you know, we blow it in the second half. I believe we're up good like job. 14. Uh, I took the videotape out of the VCR and smashed it with a hammer. I wanted nothing to do with that. I didn't want to tape over it. Just get that VHS tape out of here. It's cruel. It's cruel and unusual punishment to watch that again. And uh, then I quit sports for a good uh, three, four months. Yeah. Packed all my sport. I got two giant yellow trash bags. Took all my jerseys, anything sports related, Nike, Reebok, tuck it out, put it in the yellow <laughs> trash bag, stuffed them in the basement, and I was done with sports forever. That lasted about a good three, three or four months. Sam's familiar with this. I've done that a few times uh, during some devastating losses. Sam, quitting sports, but they always drag me back in. I wish they would. I, I have. You're not the only one that's broken some VHSs with a hammer, let me tell you that. But, hey, hey, it's going to be very interesting. We're going to be watching uh, Gonzaga. We're going to be watching a lot of college basketball, covering a lot of college basketball as the season wanes on. Guys, we're going to be looking at Gonzaga as they enter West Coast Conference play. Thanks a lot for joining us. Great stuff from Matt Santangelo and Noah. Good stuff talking Gonzaga basketball. We will catch you guys later. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the holidays. And enjoy some basketball this weekend.